Good evening, I'm Dr. Roland Roberts, and welcome to this edition of the Boardroom Series. My guest today is Joshua Tucker. Uh, Joshua is a professor of politics at uh, New York University, NYU. He's also an affiliated professor of Russian and Slavic studies. Uh, he has, or is the director of NYU's Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and uh, co-director of their NYU Social Media and Political Participation Laboratory. Uh, he has uh, been a prolific writer in different journals uh, and uh, has a, actually a, a book coming out on uh, uh, communism shadow. And of course, I want to get a few thoughts on that as well as we as we speak. But uh, uh, he has been on the uh, advisory board of the American National Election Study and the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems, numerous academic journals, and uh, so, and of course, the co-founder and co-editor of the Journal of Experimental Political Science. So, Josh, thanks for being with me today and for discussing some of the most fascinating topics and important, timely topics in the world right now. Thanks, Roland. It's a it's a pleasure to be here with you. Awesome. So, a uh, couple questions. Let's dive right in. I want to talk about social media and um, uh, social media has revolutionized how we uh, communicate our lives, uh, how we consume information what we value, and of course, the uh, what the damage that people always talked about TV and uh, video games in the uh, 70s and 80s and uh, addictions with those uh, has shifted completely to social media addictions. And so uh, what are your general thoughts uh, or immediate thoughts on uh, the role that social media has played specifically in spreading information, whether it's right information, wrong information, or what, how critical is social media to it? Right. So social media has become an increasingly large source of people's uh, information about the political world and about the world around them. Um, this is something that's been uh, an effect by age, where we now see that younger people and younger generations get the vast majority of their information about news from social media and from the Internet more generally. Uh, and so and, and what it's done, I think at the basic gist of it, the, the essence of this is that social media has changed the hierarchical structure of the manner by which people consume information about the political world and the manner by which people consume information about politics generally and then all sorts of other news, which if we think about the moment we found ourselves in right now with the COVID uh, pandemic, that becomes an even larger issue, right? And, and what do we mean when we say that it's sort of flattened, it, it's made it less hierarchical? If you think back to sort of a pre-social media era in terms of how are you going to get information about politics, how are you going to get information about the news? You're going to turn on the TV, you're going to read a newspaper, you're even, even pre-social media, you're going to go to a website, right, if you think about the earlier days of the internet. That, those decisions of what's going to appear on the news, what's going to appear in the newspaper, right, that's somebody's decision, a professional right. editor, a professional producer of a, television show, of a television news show, and that information is, in a sense, being screened for it might be relevance, it might be commercial value, but it's also going to be some degree of standards, right? Where you have journalism standards, you have professional journalists who learn a, cra a craft and a trade. And especially if you're going to end up writing for the big newspapers like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, or you're appearing on you know, big major news networks, right. you're going to be screened. There is a quality control process that's in place. What happens when we get to social media is that it democratizes who can produce information. It also democratizes who has access to information, mm -hmm. but it democratizes who can produce information as well. And the entire sort of raison d'etre behind social media is that it's user produced content, right? Facebook itself, even though we think of Facebook as the provider of information about everything, Facebook produces a tiny, tiny amount of content. Twitter produces a tiny amount of content. Right. YouTube produces a tiny amount of content. What these are are platforms that are allow users to populate them with content. Now, sometimes those users are going to be the very same big media companies, the New York Times, Fox News. Sometimes that content that's going to be produced by users is going to be links to news stories on mainstream news stories, right? So there's lots and lots of opportunities for these major legacy news providers to still provide news to people through the platform, through social media platforms. However, at the same time, you and I can both post whatever we want to post up there. If we are a little bit, perhaps a little bit younger and know what we're doing, we could make a website that looks an awful lot like a, like a real legitimate news magazine or newspaper that pretends to have existed since the 1800s, but doesn't, but doesn't actually really exist. Right. And we can share links to that. 
we can share rumors, right? One of the biggest things we're concerned about right now is WhatsApp. And on WhatsApp, it's not just that information is being shared that looks like it's newspapers, what we might call imposter news or sort of fake news, but it's just a rumor. This is what happened here. And they're going to get spread out, you know, through, through wide ranges of networks. So I think that's the biggest, that's by far the biggest change is okay. this de-emphasizing, not removing entirely, right? We got to be very clear about this. But this de-emphasizing of the hierarchy that goes around news. The other issue here is that whereas it used to be the case that if you wanted to consume news, you would have to go and choose, I'm going to turn on the TV and I'm going to watch Fox News or I'm going to watch MSNBC or I'm going to buy the New York Times, right? You would make that choice of where you would go to consume news. Now, the choice about what news you're going to consume is often being made by algorithms. Now, it may be being made directly by algorithms in the case of Facebook, where what is going to appear in your newsfeed is a function of what the people you're friends with have chosen to post, what the groups or pages you might have chosen to follow choose to post. But that's mitigated through a Facebook algorithm. Yeah, that's so let, you, let, let, you, are, you are unpacking so many different things here, which is basically yeah, yeah. an echo chamber, right? Whenever the algorithms show you what your general preferences and beliefs are, uh, it tends to show you more things that you're going to naturally agree with so in your mind, uh, you think that this is the prevailing thought, uh, which is one of the reasons I think why so many people did not see Trump's win coming in 2016. We'll get to that uh, here in a bit. But uh, but I think the, the echo chambers are designed uh, we uh, to mirror almost what we do in human life. We Birds of a feather flock together. There's not right. much difference you know, in the social algorithm setting. Well, I'm, so I'm going to push back on that a little bit and take a slightly more contrarian view of that, because what the, the, what, while there is certainly truth to everything you've just said here, mm -hmm. right, that algorithms are giving people things that they want to see, and then indeed that's what algorithms are trying to figure out. What is it that people want to see? And in addition to what is it that they want to see, what will keep them on the site, what will keep them engaged and occupied? Which is about 15% of opposite of what you believe, because we need you to be a little bit upset about what you read so that you will be engaged and keep seeing what people have to say. Well, I mean, and that, and, and I think, and that's part of the way where the academic community, I think, is uh, has pushed back. The academic researchers who research social media and politics and research social media and news, there is within this a group of people who will push back on this argument about social media um, creating more extreme echo chambers than people have, because the key thing here is the comparison. So, yes, if we want to do the comparison of when you and I were kids and we were watching, you know, the CBS Evening News with our parents, right? And we have a time in the 1970s where you get, uh, where you have, you know, 50 million people who turn into one of three mainstream news broadcasts every night to get their news, CBS, NBC, or ABC, right? Yes, at that point, those were kind of middle of the road news broadcasters. I mean, it's still 50 million people seeing basically the same six or seven stories that are chosen by three producers, right? We might call that a kind of an echo chamber too, but for the most part, right? That was a situation where people were getting middle of the road, you know, the whole country was getting kind of middle of the road news every night. However, if your comparison point becomes the 1990s, where we see the emergence of cable television, there's a brilliant book by a former colleague of mine from Princeton named Marcus Pryor called Broadcast Democracy. And Pryor makes the arguments in, the, in this book that what happens when you get cable television is two things happen simultaneously. One is... There are way more options at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern, right, 7 o'clock at night, than just watching the news. All of a sudden, you can watch golf, you can watch tennis, you can watch gardening, right? You can do whatever you want to do. So you get a whole lot of people who drop out of the news business entirely. They stop watching television news. In the same respect, you also get the option to go to Fox News, and then eventually MSNBC emerges. So you now have an option when we get into the 90s where you can surround yourself entirely in an echo chamber. You can put yourself so that all the news without any interruption, no one's going to come into your house and say, you've been watching Fox News for too long. I'm going to change the channel and make you watch something else. You can put yourself into a situation. Mm -hmm. If you go to social media, yes, birds of a feather flock together. And yes, people tend to have friends online who are of similar political persuasion. Mm -hmm, Like-minded. But it's not 100%. Right. And it may not even be 75%, because everyone can tell you about their uncle, crazy uncle who posts these things, or their friends from high school, or their kids' parents' friends, you know, from the school and stuff like that. It's not the only, we don't just join social media for political reasons. Oh, in fact, most really we don't. Uh, uh, 
you know, joined for that at all. So the question that I have here is, is there a difference between news and information? Because news, as it was with the big broadcasters back in, you know, the 80s, that was actual world events or local events. Uh, what, what, it, what news has morphed into is opinion personalities and opinion pieces. Uh, really, uh, they, they'll take a premise, uh, most newscasts, including the primetime shows, the most popular in the world, uh, aren't let's update you on everything that's happening in the world. It is, here's this one piece that happened, and then I'm going to bring on three or four pundits that uh, you know are, are going to battle that out. So it's more right. how to think, of trying to, and most of the time, we all know that there is a general narrative that uh, is behind, or intention behind what, what is debated, and, and they know kind of a general outcome that they want to see uh, at the end. Uh, knowing that there's not going to be a general consensus. So the difference between news and information, whenever your crazy Uncle Joe posts something, uh, you know, that's it, maybe information, it may be misinformation, wrong information, but people uh, are now taking, in my opinion, they are taking a lot of information that is passed off as news, uh, but, it, but it really isn't news. It's just, it's just random information. Yeah, so we've lost that filtering mechanism that we used to have. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is, is that the professional newscasting organizations are now have to compete for eyeballs in a way that they didn't have to previously. But you know, in, a, in, a, in another way of looking at it is that this sort of era that we hearken back to with right. the CBS Evening News and these kinds of things, that may have actually been more the exception than the rule. Now, I'm, I'm not a media scholar. I study social media and politics. But if you talk to people about this, right, prior to the post-World War II era, when people got most of their news from sort of tabloid newspapers, the expectation was these were all going to be news sources that had very biased points. Now, newspapers have historically tried to make a distinction between the news section and the opinion section. Mm -hmm. And the point you're making right now is that when you turn on CNN and they're doing a panel of four people, is that news or is that opinion? Well, it's news if it's a balanced panel, but it's opinion of the people who are on the panel, right? Or some of them are more newsy and some of them are more opinion-y. Right. Um, but also around the world, right, if you look at European newspapers, right, you go to any European who lives in Spain, who lives in France, they'll tell you which of the newspapers, you know, are from the more from the left side, which are more from the right side. Right. Now, you do have exceptions, which is that in other countries of the world, you have very strong, robust public broadcasting systems. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate example of this is the BBC in the UK, right, where there is still a very strong voice that is in the middle of the spectrum and that is, you know, undoubtedly in the news, in the news business. But we got to remember, right, like these things are, you know, these things are kind of at odds with each other, right? Like when we say, oh, social media has, you know, has social media lessened the echo chamber that people find themselves in, right, as, as opposed to, well, part of the reason it lessens that is because it's democratizing access to information. And some of when you democratize access to information, that's going to have a lot of positive benefits, right? If we think that having people in echo chambers all the time is potentially bad for increasing political polarization in a country, having people have more fluid access to information might push back on that. Right. On the other hand, when we democratize access to information, we are removing those quality checks that we had when we had the much more hierarchical systems of who provides. It can validate the misinformation. It can validate misinformation. Yeah. Well, and that becomes, and this is this huge question that sort of burst onto the field, you know, where re people really started talking about this in the last few years, which is this issue about, right, what is the costs of this democratization of information? Well, one of the costs of it we now know is that you can put forward information that either you can dress it up and make it look like it's a real newspaper, right. which... Uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson at the University of Pennsylvania has called and said we should instead of calling that fake news, we should call it imposter news. It's mm -hmm. people pretending to be you know, pretending to be news. Right. Yeah. We can also have all sorts of things where people, you know, spread rumors and 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 are sharing things that are knowingly incorrect. When we talk about it in the in in from the academic side, we sometimes try to distinguish between misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda. Okay. Give, right? give us so, a quick yeah. Break it down. Yeah. So misinformation is you and I get a piece of information somehow, it's wrong, we don't know it's wrong, but we share it thinking it's correct, but there's no sort of, you know, it might be that it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of things we can think of that fall in the thing. A store is open until 12 o'clock. Well, it turns out the store is actually open until six o'clock. There's nothing malicious about what we're doing there, 
Right. Another way, however, might be disinformation, right? We might spread a rumor that the store is closing at six o'clock because we want to be able to go at seven o'clock and have it be not so crowded, right? That would be disinformation. Then there is probably what is a much larger issue of what is people are concerned about is this sort of politicized, propagandized way of discussing the news where, you know, the information might be correct. You know, there are, well, I, you know, I'm not going to use the, the unemployment numbers are crazy right now. But if you think about just for a couple of months ago, right, you could report the numbers and you could say, look, the unemployment rate is 3.7 percent thanks to the amazing work of our fantastic president. Or you could report the unemployment rate is 3.7 percent despite the fact that our president is doing nothing to increase wages for the lowest earners in society, right? Like both of those would be completely true statements. There wouldn't be misinformation or disinformation, but they're presenting the information in a sort of slanted way. And one of the things that's happened uh, in, you know, one of the things that's come out of the academic studies of at least around the 2016 election is that it turns out that as a proportion of information, well, we've learned a kind of couple big things about disinformation, about any one of these this misinformation or fake news or whatever you want to call this disinformation, misinformation. We've learned a lot about this in 2016, and sort of two big things stand out. One is that, like a lot of things on the internet, it's these kind of malicious behaviors, exposure to to fake news, the sort of real hardcore fake news, like these fake newspapers that pretend to be newspapers that aren't. Um, exposure to this kind of information, sharing this kind of information, it follows a power law distribution in the sense that what we're seeing here is that lots of people got very, very low levels of exposure or did low levels of engaging in this kind of behavior. And then small numbers of people got high levels of exposure. And we find that across a whole bunch of different things. We find that in costs who was exposed to these kind of fake news and low quality news websites on Twitter. We find it across web browsing behavior, studies that have been done to look at what websites people visited. We found it in research that we did at the, in the SMAP lab, um, we found it in terms of who shared fake news on Facebook. So we had a study that was in the field uh, over the course of the 2016 elections where a certain we were running a panel survey and a certain number of the people in the survey agreed to share their Facebook behavior with us. So they were, we were able to get access to what they had posted online on Facebook. And one of the things that we found out there was that the vast majority of the people, now we looked at these kind of very hardcore fake news, fake news right, sites, like right. the Denver, you know, the Denver Guardian was pretending to be a newspaper, didn't actually <laughs> exist, you know, it's totally fake. And we found that in our sample, 90, over 91% of the people never shared a single link to any of these fake news sites. So this was concentrated in about 9% of our sample. Now, some people shared a lot of them. So we've seen a lot where we've learned that a lot of this follows this kind of power law behavior, in 2016 anyway. Um, the second thing we learned is that the ratio of fake news or suspect news or low quality news to hard news is still really, really low. So even though we're talking a lot about this problem, even though we're concerned about this problem, and we're concerned about this problem for good reasons, right? it's important to remember denominators, right? And that most people, most of the access that they're getting to news is still the kind of news that you and I would consider news. Now, it's very possible that a little bit of false information can prove extremely harmful. We're recording this right during the, the COVID pandemic, right? A little bit of false information about drinking bleach can be extremely helpful, in, and it can be extremely harmful, right? In politics, a little bit of misinformation that leads people to, you know, engage in violent behavior against fellow citizens when you have someone walking into a, a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. with a rifle, and that could have been tragic, right? So, so it's not to mitigate the severity of the problem, but I think it's important that we put it into context. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the other things is when it comes to the rumors, you don't even have to say things. Questions are some of the most dangerous things to allow the rumor mill to get going. And there's probably there's de full deniability. Like I didn't say I didn't say that they did that. I just right. hey did uh, was that person there that night? I'm not sure. Well, everyone starts to think. Yeah, you know what? That would make a lot of sense. That would fill in the blank. And so right. it's questions can can lead in direct people who are already naturally bent to certain narratives can can really expand that. So and then of course if I have depending on the echo chamber that I'm in, uh, where they validate that, not just. Right. around me where I'm constantly hearing it, but it's by validating it with the, the, the misinformation sites or fake news or whatever it is, um, 
that knows that I'm I'm reading a lot of those things because of my browsing history or whatever, then those ads are you know they're able to put the the stories and that I would find relevant they in their minds that validate that really. Right. And so, and again, but I think the key thing is exactly what you're talking about, that this is probably something that's happening to a small portion of the population. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, but only, look, the, the, the revolution happened with only 3% of people for it. You know, I mean, we're a country because only 3% of people were, were right. for the exactly. war for independence. So it's not to say it's not consequential, but I do, I do want to just sort of push on this just a little bit, yeah. which is that because there are, as you said, there are other side effects that come out from a situation where we are talking about uh, we're talking about the prevalence of misinformation. We're talking about the internet as a source of fake news. We're talking about how much you're going to encounter this. And remember, it's a power law for who's actually exposed to this. It's a power law for who's actually sharing this kind of behavior. And as you rightly point out, right, even small numbers of people doing this can be extremely consequential. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is that everybody is hearing the discussion about how this is a big problem. And let me offer two potential things that we were concerned about for this. One, and they're related to each other. One, and we don't know the answers to this yet, is whether or not when we continue to talk to people about the prevalence of disinformation and fake news online, whether or not that has a knock-on effect of people making people more suspicious of news generally, right? Less likely to trust mainstream news. Right. The second thing that this can interact with is if you have political leaders who then try to weaponize this concept of fake news by saying that any news that's negative or reports bad things about them is fake, mm -hmm. right? So if you have two things going on, if you have political leaders who are willing, and we there, there are people who do this around the world and domestically at home as well, right? If you have political leaders who are willing to try to weaponize this as a, as a, as a weapon, and then you have the general population that's heard, as you said, in the back of your head, oh, I heard there's all this fake news out there. Well, maybe when the leader says that this thing being critical of them is fake, yeah, maybe that's right. And so we, one thing we do know is that in order to have a functioning democracy, a free press is absolutely crucial to holding political leadership accountable. Right. And so if this sort of underlying belief that there's a fake news problem out there, combined with politicians who are willing to harp on this all the time uh, when they get negative coverage in the press, that combination of things, in my opinion, may actually be more dangerous. Yeah. It's misinformation about the disinformation. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. it's the sort of pervasiveness of our words about this, the knock on indirect effects of believing that we're living in a post-truth world, when in reality, the vast majority of what most people are seeing on social media about news is actually from mainstream news sources that, as we've said, have partisan proclivities and some of them more than others and everything like that. Okay, but, but the vast majority of what people is, is consuming is probably, you know, when we were being told this, you know, this is what happened in the economy today, this is what happened in this, you know, in this international inter incident today, the vast majority of news people are encountering about that is probably correct. But the question is, what's the long-term consequences if they stop believing it? And that's what actually makes me a little bit more worried about this whole thing that's happening. And I think as we continue, you know, now look, that is not in any way, shape or form to denigrate exactly what you said. Small numbers of people, right, can cause big harm, right? And we know the only place we really know about social media actually leading to people getting killed is of course in India, where rumors on WhatsApp about what had happened in communities led to people being attacked and led to violence and actual deaths, right? So it's not to mitigate against that. And we're in the middle of this, uh, this coronavirus pandemic right now, where a little bit of misinformation can be deadly, yeah. right? And and, it, and about. But so too can skepticism you know, of, of, of the press. And if the question is, is that people are reading news stories saying, hey, you need to stay home. That's the best way we're going to flatten the curve on this virus. And people are saying, oh, that's just the mainstream media. I don't trust them. They're perverters of fake news. That could have, you know, serious societal ramifications. Well, and I, and I don't want to get too far into the in, into just the, the, the news in general because, you know, they've cried wolf so many times that I think I agree with you. People are saying you cried wolf so many times and uh, by the numbers, more people will die from alcohol this year. And more people will die from, you know, uh, alcohol or excuse me, automobile accidents and the seasonal flu this year than, you know, so there's all kinds of different whatever information that different groups are putting out. Um, 
And so there is that skepticism. And I, I agree that uh, it, whenever you have to discern, I think discernment is really a skill and art that we have to develop because you can't just go to a single well to get get news. But here's what I want to do for the executives in the in the in the chairman and you know yeah, CEOs that, that watch our broadcast. Um, so let's say that I'm not the president uh, of the United States worried about the the disinformation misinformation warfare, uh, but I'm the CEO of a company and competitors are putting out either misinformation, once again, question, hey, I'm not sure. I heard that they may not be able to get that product out this year. I don't know that for sure, you know, but uh, so so it's kind of uh, passive aggressive, benign question marks. Uh, but it, it truly is information warfare, uh, 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 forms of it, uh, commercial warfare. What are your thoughts um, and how should uh, really a CEO uh, respond and leaders respond to things like that, which uh, kind of goes into content moderation? Uh, right. I, you know, when people post negative reviews and negative comments. Uh, so what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so there's actually a, there's quite a bit of, of academic social science research that's been on this question of how do you how do you deal with misinformation once it's out there, once people believe misinformation? You, my advice to CEOs who are watching this is you should talk to social scientists and actually think about running some of your own studies. It's not that hard, actually, these days where we have all these kind of online platforms and we have things like Mechanical Turk, because there's a real debate in the academic literature. So on the one hand, there's a fear of something called the backfire effect. And the backfire effect is that I've heard some misinformation about your company. I've heard, oh, I, I hear they use, you know, they have, you know, they use rats. And when they say they're, you know, to supplement the beef, right? right? right. And, uh, and, and then you come out and, you, and you're the CEO and you make an announcement and you say, I want to let everybody know we never use rats when we're making beef. And again, I just hear this in the background because I'm busy and not really paying attention. I'm like, oh, yeah, the guy said something about the rats and the beef again. Must be true, right? So there, there was a lot of concern about this kind of backfire effect that when you try to correct misinformation. However, there's been a lot more recent research, which is finding out that this backfire effect may not have been as severe as we originally thought from the sort of first studies that have been done with this. But people have tried to do on the positive side, what are some ways that you can do to sort of correct misinformation? One of the most important things I've seen, so there's sort of two big things that come out of politics. One is that uh, these, these corrections seem to be better when they have a kind of compelling competing narrative. So for example, if the, mis if the rumor is that you, you, know, you burn down your house because you were smoking a cigarette in bed, right? If you come out and just say, I did not smoke a cigarette in bed, that's not why my house burned down, that's less compelling than if you say, there were rags in my closet and my teenage kid was playing or was looking for a baseball bat and knocked over the oil kerosene can that was next to the rags. And that, when it got really hot, led to the house catching on fire people are much more likely to update on the latter than they were there are on the former. So that's one, I think, concrete piece of advice. But again, this is, may vary but across politics and business, but this is the kind of thing that by doing simple online experiments, you can actually check this yourself and see how these things work in regard to your, in regard to your products. The other, I mean, the other thing I would, that we've learned is that corrections tend to be resonate more when they come from unlikely sources. And unlikely sources sort of means in, in the politics world, it's from the politician who's likely to benefit from it, right? So when John McCain comes out and says, this is nonsense about Barack Obama's birth certificate, right. that's a lot more convincing to people who are inclined to be skeptical of Obama than if Joe Biden comes out and says it's right. nonsense about Barack Obama's birth certificate, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, one thing, you know, and so this is, this is you know, how you translate this to the business world, right? If there's a rumor about Coca-Cola you know, stripping paint off of cars, if the CEO of Pepsi comes out and says, that's hogwash, everybody knows that Coca-Cola doesn't strip paint off of cars, right? That's probably likely to be more convincing than if the CEO of Coca-Cola comes out and right. says it in terms of people. So those are a couple insights that we've learned. The bigger insight we've learned is that you know, we, have gotten, uh, we have gotten a lot better at doing um, experiments in this regard and learning how to actually sort of tease out causality from these things. And it's not that hard to set up a sort of simple experiment where you try different sets of treatments. And when companies think about, you know, companies do all sorts of things about risk management planning and research and development and stuff like that. This might be something I'm thinking about that we do live in an era of misinformation and where it's possible for misinformation to spread and beginning to think 
about how you would deal with I, with periods of time when your company faces misinformation, doing putting a little bit of R and D development on the sort of social science about thinking about how you would how you would manage these strategies um, should they come up, I think might be something that's that's worth thinking about moving forward. Yeah, I I completely agree. So if you were if your company, if, if someone came on and started bashing either your product or an experience that they had at one of your stores or things like that, would you instruct your social media department to uh, delete that comment or would you uh, want them to respond in, you know, in a PR way uh, and then just leave it even though the person's going to keep going on? How would you advise them uh, in that scenario? Right. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say here, which is that I'm I'm not in marketing, I'm not expertise, <laughs> so I don't want to give bad advice in this regard. I think there's different situations. What what I do think that we have, you know, what we have some degree of understanding of now is we're beginning to see more and more research on this. When misperceptions take place, when people get these ideas in their head that are inc- the incorrect pieces of information. Um, that they that there are some better and worse ways to try to deal with dislodging those types of things. I can't tell you whether it's better to you know let someone spew whatever they want to spew, or it's better to to take them off and then have someone later on come and accuse you of having taken. A, that's for that's for the PR experts to sort of <laughs> to try to do these things. But I do think you know what we're what we're finding. So we've, we've been doing some research recently about science related misinformation, and there seems to be quite a big difference when things are politicized and when they're not politicized. Such as climate so change. Look, yeah, climate change. Exactly. You see big differences around around issues of climate change. We also have, you know, we have a kind of we have a a, a a study that we've been working a big study that we've had in the field in our lab just about how good people are at identifying false information generally when news stories contain false or misleading information as opposed to true information, and it's heavily heavily slanted by partisanship. Right. Mm-hmm. Liberals are not great at identifying are not as good as at identifying fake news or mis- stories that are rated by professional fact checkers as false or misleading. Liberals are not as good as identifying that those are false or misleading when it has a pro liberal slant mm-hmm. and vice versa for conservatives. Yes. And in this other work that we've been doing, right, we've been finding these much bigger differentials on some scientific misinformation questions, such as global warming. Right. Where uh, where Republicans or conservatives are much more likely to believe misinformation around global warming than liberals are. And other scientific questions such as vaccines and autism where, and the sort of misinformation around vaccines and autism, which seems to be actually, interestingly enough, people who are more extreme on the political spectrum are more likely to believe this type of misinformation, not to be sort of a straight partisan effect. But now, I mean, so but, I'm in the business back of to, studying. Political. This goes back to what you said a few moments ago. Because in each one of the cases that uh, you outlined, the the information that is available um, uh, might be misinformation or disinformation, almost uh, and elements of it on both sides, which allows the the person uh, receiving the information to almost choose based on their leanings which which bucket they want to go in. So, for example, uh, take climate change and global warming, and th- th- there are those that would. They, they have a hard time believing it because the scientific community, when you say stats like whatever, 90 percent of scientists agree, you know, with this. Well, the the other side would argue, well, that's because in the scientific community, you're not allowed to disagree or you are kicked out of the scientific community. You are no longer a part. That's been proven uh, by a couple people. One won the Nobel Prize and then thought, you know, well, I've reached the pinnacle of, of what anyone in my field can do said some things counter to something similar to global warming and was immediately stripped of his uh, professorship, just of everything, um, and was basically ostracized from scientific community. So then this segment that believes uh, does not believe in climate change latches on to something like that and says, well, they don't have freedom of thought. They're not allowed to disagree. So, of course, they want to keep their jobs so the majority of them will agree so that we can now use this stat. So that there are, there are other issues at hand that lend itself i think to to muddy the waters of where is the where does the truth lie well mo- i mean most misinformation right like if we just you know there's no scientific misinformation out there about it's a good idea to look at the sun 
right, right with your eyes open because right. people go blind if they do that right so it's not most misinformation that's out there is always going to be it's going to be complex it's going to be around whether this is scientific misinformation or political misinformation right like these are going to be things that there are reasons why people want to believe that certain things are true and certain things are not true whether it's that they play to predispositions in one particular way or the other whether it's because it would be economically beneficial for them to believe something is true whether it's because they just want a solution they're terrified of of a pandemic and they want to believe that if they rub garlic under their nose they're not going to get it right like there, you know, so there are reasons why they want to do this and why these things are sort of complex about this. So, I mean, I think my one of the things that we've learned in the political science field about this, you were asking me about these questions about what do you do to correct this misinformation that's out there about your company, you know, is this, we are constantly dealing with information that's in a politicized context. And misinformation that's in a politicized context is different, right? And, we, and as I said, we've seen this in scientific misinformation as well. It's different than misinformation that's in a that's in a non-politicized context. And so uh, to me, that's the interesting thing about thinking about how this plays out for these kind of CEOs and these questions, right? It's easy in the Barack Obama birth certificate situation for me to come up with who is the unlikely source, right? Who's the one who stands to benefit from it, who if they correct the misinformation is likely to have the larger effect. Mm -hmm. Less clear to what that would be in the corporate world. But there might be, you know, similar things that are ways that you can do this in the corporate world. Um, but some of these other things, like providing a compelling alternative narrative, right, for things, that's something that travels, you know, that one might think might travel beyond the political. Of course, my research has been on politics, so that's that's where I know. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to one one thing, and I'm going to ask it differently, and maybe get an answer that some people can can draw, uh, maybe what not to do from. But, uh, you know, you've, your studies are obviously been on the Russian regime and Slavic nations and so forth. So um, how do authoritarian regimes handle uh, op online opposition? So that's a fa fascinating question, right? We, um, it's kind of really, really interesting in the sense that we, uh, we witnessed the sort of evolution for social media mm -hmm. uh, and politics, this kind of whipsaw whiplash about it, right? Like you started off our interview today saying, well, everybody is going to say that all things bad that are happening are coming out of social media now, the same way it used to be <laughs> video games, you know, like 20 years ago. But of course, if we were having this conversation, you know, a whopping eight years ago, right, which again, in, in COVID world seems like a long time, right. but most of the time that doesn't seem like that long ago, social media was hailed as this tool that was going to bring democracy around the rest of the world. This was finally going to right. break the link of authoritarian governments over their people because they were no longer going to be able to control the information environment. And we have a piece that we wrote, I uh, wrote with several colleagues in the journal of democracy that where we try to investigate this, which is called from liberation to turmoil. Right. And so the question we ask is how did you go so quickly in, in really in about six years from 2011, when the same Journal of Democracy p produced an article called Liberation Technology that was about social media and the aftermath of the Arab Spring and how it was going to bring democracy around the world, to a whopping, you know, by 2017, Nate Persley at Stanford University wrote a, wrote a piece in the Journal of Democracy called Can Democracy Survive the Internet, <laughs> right? And even by modern standards, six years is a kind of whiplash period for this to have changed this much. And we make the argument in this particular piece that um, if you think of sort of make just two basic assumptions, right? One is that social media, uh, that one is, uh, one is that social media um, does in fact democratize access to information, right? So, and in doing so, right, it gives voice to people who are excluded from access to mainstream media. Yes. However, at the same time, despite the fact that it democratizes access to information, Social media is also a tool that can be used for censorship, mm -hmm. right? So we can still use social media as a tool for censoring the information that people have access to. And we can think of lots of different ways to do that. That if you take these sort of two simple assumptions, right, that it gives voice to people who don't have access to mainstream media, and it's a tool that can be used for censorship, this can actually walk you through and help you understand how social media can be both liberation technology and can democracy survive the internet. And the way you think about this, right, if you think about all the way back in 2011, right, in these early days of social media, you've got um, who are the people who are in non-democratic regimes who are excluded from access to mainstream media? Well, it's people who are, who are opposed to the regime, 
Now, this might be people who want to overthrow that regime with another non-democratic regime, but this certainly includes people who want to bring about democratic change in autocratic societies. Mm -hmm. And so the sort of first thing that happens from social media is it gives those people voice. They can use that voice to communicate with one another. They can use that to get organized. They can do all these things. And so you see the Arab Spring, you see Gezi Park in Turkey, you see Euromaidan in Ukraine. However, when that happens, when you ask how authoritarian regimes respond to this kind of online opposition, right, autocrats are not great at getting new problems, right? <laughs> if you're an autocrat, you're probably surrounded by a lot of people who they owe their job to being in your good graces. They don't want to tell you there are these distant problems on the horizon. Right. But eventually they figure this out. Right. And so these autocratic regimes, then, if, you know, if the if 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 these early days of liberation technology is, you know, social media is the new hope. Right. This is the empire strikes back. Eventually, the regimes realize that there is there are threats here. Yes. Right. And they begin to develop tools for how they can then deal with this online opposition. And in other work that we've done, we sort of identified three different ways that authoritarian regimes can respond to this kind of online opposition, okay. right? One is they can respond offline, right? Mm -hmm. They can take, find people who are, you know, posting things online against the government and they can arrest them. Right. In extreme situations, they can kill them. Right. They can also respect, you know, react on, offline by adjusting the legal environment nationalizing, you know, social media companies, which is what happened in Russia with Vukontakte, which was the sort of Russian version of Facebook, mm -hmm. where they kicked out the person who was running it, he fled the country, and they replaced him with people who were much more pliant to the Kremlin. Right. So you can respect, you can, you can, you know, you can react offline. You can also, of course, react online. And we can think about two different ways that you can react online. One way that you can react online is sort of the way you would think about traditional censorship. Right. You try to remove people's remove content online or you restrict people's access to content. Mm -hmm. And that would be an old tool used in a new environment. Right. right. And so you can think about the sort of extreme you know, example of this is the Great Firewall of China, where you actually block people from accessing huge swaths of the Internet. And in the same respect, you try to remove posts once they're posted that are anti, you know, that are that are problematic. However, you have another tool at your disposal, which is that you can try to engage and change the tenor of the conversation online. And when you try to do that, we can think in some ways that was supposed to be the promise of e-government, right? We can think of very benign ways that regimes can get involved, which is that leaders go online and they explain directly to the public what they're thinking, right? This was supposed to be the promise of e-government. It was going to bring elites closer to ordinary citizens right. because they could communicate with them this way. So we might think of some ways of engaging online as not being uh, malicious in any way, shape, or form. But of course, we can also think of more malicious ways. We can think about bots. We can think about um, trolls, which are sort of human, you know, deceptive actors online. It, 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 AI, advanced AI, uh, as it relates to it. Yeah, advanced so, AI, right? Yeah. So you know, two right. two thoughts with that. First of all, uh, I think for businesses and companies, the last option you gave is usually, once again situationally, uh, you know, discernment must apply. But uh, generally speaking, that's the best way to go as a leader of a company is to try and change the narrative, engage, um, give the information, change, uh, provide your narrative of maybe the uh, events of a customer service call gone wrong uh, or right. whenever there's an incident on a plane that goes viral. Uh, right. you know, a lot of times the, 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 uh, the airlines will put out their, uh, their new narrative, uh, you, you know, and... Um, and so I do think that that's appropriate to engage. The, the days of putting uh, sweeping it under the carpet uh, is is not possible. Uh, it's not effective anyway. Uh, and the other thing is, at the same time that you respond, it's important for something totally uh, a totally different piece of news that is favorable to you to be also hitting. For example, whenever Starbucks had the red cup issue, and a lot of uh, the faith community had a lot of issues with uh, a couple of years ago, where they 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 thought they were you know abandoning Christmas or you know somehow it was an attack on their their faith because the cups w were only red and didn't have uh, they, they just changed the cups and so what Starbucks did and it was gaining ground even though it, there there wasn't you know it was a silly you know thing it didn't right. gain a lot have a lot of merit but it didn't matter it was gaining so much tra attraction uh, that uh, you know a few days later the completely different side of of Starbucks they have a shelf full of things like this ready for different, you know, crises, right. uh, but roll out that they are paying, um, 
tuition for their even their part time employees. Uh, you know, and so all of a sudden, people they, 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 we're talking about Starbucks, a whole different thing that they're doing, and right. it gets it off of that. So I think there are different strategies companies can use. Um, I've also seen companies, uh, you know, do it very well. Uh, the city of Daytona Beach, for example, uh, I've seen that that government where a lot of different information may come out, but they started and a lot of governments, you know, communicate directly to the citizens. They put out their, you know, not not their opinion or perspective on what happened, but just here's what was said <laughs> uh, or here's mm. what was passed or here was this. No narrative around these things, right. no color around these things, just the actual facts of whatever they're doing, you know, or what's going on. Uh, you know, road construction is going to happen from this time to this time on this day and this day. Not debating whether it should happen between this time and this time and this day. Right. The other thing I would say is, is, is I don't think people understand, especially in the United States, the degree to which uh, how powerful information is. It is the essence. People live and die based on information. Uh, an old proverb, you know, de 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 death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, words are critical. They're important. Uh, wars have been started over, you know, people, somebody saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, and so when I uh, am in China, for example, you know, Google you, you, is not allowed. You can't Google. It's blocked. Uh, right. so we, we say Google it, it's, but, but you can't there. Uh, they have their alternatives, of course, just like Russia. Um, but uh, same thing with Facebook. You can't, you can't use Google Docs. So people who try to have virtualized business environments that are right. using you know, Google in their virtualization environment, uh, that's not an effective global application right. because of, because of the, 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 the blockage. Uh, you can't uh, even use Dropbox. You can't use a lot of the way we work mm -hmm. as, as Americans. Uh, those things aren't even allowed. Uh, and, and, of course, a lot of it is, is not just the control over the, the speech, but a lot of it is control... Um, over the profit, so um, it's it's economics keeping the economics in the country as opposed to you know using c companies outside. So uh, I, I want to go to one thing before uh, uh, for just a moment, uh, okay? And, and that is uh, you know on uh, as it relates to uh, how we take information in. A couple times you have mentioned uh, uh, how. If the TV's playing in the background, uh, it's kind of like it's it's a, a passive learning that is happening where whenever we're debating back and forth, we're both thinking critically and saying, how do I feel about that? What do I think about that? How does that match up with our experiences, our education? Uh, and we're running through a whole list of things. But whenever I'm watching TV or, or, or a movie, we're mindless. Uh, it's like we take down our, our filter and we just accept what we're hearing without a whole lot of critique um, whenever it's passive listening. Uh, so speak, if you can, for a moment on uh, the either, I mean, do, it, do you see it as a dangerous, uh, as something where we need to consciously uh, or be more conscious about what we intake and if, uh, on the evaluation? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, again, what was so unique about what happened in 2016 is there was a vulnerability that was exploited here. Now, in some, in some cases, it was a vulnerability literally exploited by a foreign power to attempt to manipulate things that were going on inside here. But if we think about just the sort of the, the fake news stories that were out generally, right, the vulnerability was people were used to going online, going on devices, going on to social media, seeing news stories, believing they were true, and just kind of accepting what was in there, right? And so... There is a question about this issue of how people consume information, right? When they're in habits of consuming information in one way, and suddenly there becomes a new way to produce that type of information that people aren't aware of. So I think on the one hand, right, like that was a particular moment. After that, we've talked about a lot of the negative consequences about people talking about the rise of fake news, but there's also the fact that people are more aware that this is a possibility, which also might be problematic in, the, in, the way, in ways as well. This question about, though, in the modern digital era of how we consume information generally, right? Yeah. This is something I think that has a very high level of generational component to it. So you and I might sit here and think, look, the way that you're going to consume information is pay attention to the information. 
get the newspaper, open up the newspaper, sit down and read it. And don't do six other things while you're doing that. Or turn on a news program, listen to what people are saying. But one of the interesting things that we, you know, that we know as political scientists is that like the vast, vast, vast majority of people don't care about politics at all. They pay very little attention to it. And so the vast majority of people, this may be how they're consuming a lot of their information about politics, that it's very passive, right? That it's something they're scrolling through Facebook to see other things, but they actually might, Facebook may actually be getting people to know more about the news than they would otherwise, because a lot of people, as we talked about before, right, when cable television came about, and there was other stuff to watch at seven o'clock at night, people stopped watching the news. Right. right. There's a really fascinating study that was done by uh, Hunt Alcott, who's a professor at NYU, and Matt Genskow, who's a professor at Stanford, where they took Americans off of Facebook for a month. They did a randomized trial where they removed people off Facebook for a month. And at the end of that time, the people who came off Facebook were happier. <laughs> they had higher levels of subjective well-being, but they had lower levels of knowledge about news. We did, a, we did a study ourselves where we took people off of Facebook for a week last summer in Bosnia, Herzegovina, actually, um, and we were studying something else. We wanted to study the impact of this on, on sort of sentiment towards uh, other ethnic groups within Bosnia. But we also found in that study that when we took people off Facebook for a week, they knew less about the news at the end of that week. So again, these things are kind of all trade-offs, but the, I, I do want to come back to this generational thing. Like younger kids today, I mean, one of the biggest arguments that I get into with my son is we'll turn a movie on and we'll be watching a movie together and I'll look down and he's playing a game on his phone and he's texting people and he's also checking Instagram. And I'm like, we're watching a movie. Right. Why can't you just watch the movie? But for him, that's the new normal, right? And people, I mean, and you, you, you jokingly talked about the fact that, you know, 20 years ago, video games were the root of all evil. But they also found out that video games made people much better fighter pilots. Like, brains are kind of malleable. And I think it's going to be fascinatingly interesting watching this younger generation that really is used to consuming new, consuming media writ large, right, in multiple streams simultaneously, and how that's going to affect. And, you know, and you and I, we grew up without this stuff, but now we're in the middle of it. Or we're inundated. And we're, you know, we were talking before this interview. I had to turn off my notifications because I didn't want people from my, I didn't want to see the Slack messages from my lab while I was interviewing with you and have, you know, text messages popping up at the same time. We're learning how to do that. But I think you're absolutely right to say we don't know the consequences of that. But we are starting to learn that actually people having these giant social media platforms that provide people with news may actually be leading to a more informed electorate. Well, it's definitely uh, providing a lot of conversation. And I think that's that part is very beneficial because um, for decades we were told to not talk about politics or religion. And in fact, one could argue that those are the two most important topics to be discussing as a human rate, as a human uh, you know, race, mm -hmm. because that's what controls and drive so much of our lives. It, those two issues drive have driven most wars throughout history, you know. I uh, and so I think that there are. Uh, it, it is critical to have these kind of conversations. And and here's the here's the last thing I, I want us to talk about is is understanding the difference too between news and what you think. So, for example, a lot of times on social media when people put their opinion, uh, it, it can be construed as fact. And, and, and in the generational gaps, a lot of the younger generation care more about either consensus or about what their friends think on a matter than the facts of a matter. And, and, and so I don't know if that's a generational thing and it cha evolves. I don't know what your studies have seen. Or, uh, but if somebody, except based on their personality, there are some who are just being like, they will be the one who does something different. But there's a reason why peer pressure is effective. You know, in grade school, uh, you don't want to have contrary views to, you don't want to be the one uh, contrarian in the group. You know, a lot of people will do something they normally would not have done if everybody else is doing it. They'll go along to get along kind of philosophy. And so where, do you see danger in that, uh, in the information world? 
Uh, I, first off, I would push back on it. I don't think this is a, a feature of young people in the slightest. And actually, uh, in the big finding that came out of our study of who shared fake news on Facebook was that it was people who were over the age of 65, on mm -hmm. average, shared seven times as many links to these suspect fake news I, websites than the millennials did. But the youngers are talking about how they feel about things. I f think the older ones are sharing the misinformation, but the younger ones, if they say something, uh, like my 14-year-old my daughter, when she's talking to all of her friends about politics and world events, uh, they're talking about how they feel about it, which is a very different conversation and narrative than sharing, you know, news, right or wrong news. You know what I mean? I mean, I'll, I'll respectfully disagree with you on this one. Okay. That there's that there's a big a big generational divide on this. I think we're all dealing with this kind of simultaneously, which is I, I would come back to the main point we made before. Right? We've had a massive, massive shift in the. Um, in the manner in which people get news about the world and information about the world, right? We have always had a peer-to-peer -peer network to get information about the world, but it was face-to-face -face or it was one-to-one, -one, right? Like, so it was, you know, maybe you and I can't talk right now, but we could pick up the phone and call each other because right. we're in different states and stuff like that. We've had that for quite some time. Like, we've gotten used to that. But the vast majority of ways that we got information beyond those networks, those small networks in which we were engaged, our personal networks, was from these managed sources of newspapers, television news, right, radio, those sorts of things. All things that had people who were responsible to someone, be it an employer, you know, who were who were had a degree of standards they were trying to upheld in the, in the, in, the, in this kind of news and these sorts of things. What social media has done, and what the internet has done generally is it has changed, it has flattened that in terms of we can get information from other individuals in a way that is radically different from the way we used to be able to because A, the number of other individuals we can get information from has increased dramatically. B, the geographic and interpersonal constraints on that have increased dramatic, you know, have decreased dramatically, right? And then the final question becomes, and this has always been an interesting question to us, is that how does it change when you consume it? You know, like, so if you and I watch the same thing on the CBS Evening News 30 years ago, we take, you know, from it, how do we interpret that same piece of information differently if I go and log on Facebook and I see, oh, Roland shared this. Well, I trust him. He must be someone who's, you know, who's doing this. Mm -hmm. that, that we get information now, it comes not just, it doesn't just come as information, and we think about this a lot in terms of political participation. It's not just, I, you know, if I used to find out that there was going to be a protest taking place in Washington Square Park because I saw a flyer on a telephone pole. Well, I learned information about that protest from that flyer on that telephone pole. But if I see on Facebook, you say that there's going to be a protest in Washington Square Park, and you comment on that and say, this is a terrible thing. Why would anyone want to waste their time supporting this interest? And it gets 500 thumbs up right. from people who I respect. You know, the question is, does that change the way that we're consuming information? So I think what we're in is a moment of time in which the way that we consume information, both, and this, this does apply equally to political news and to business news and to things about companies, right? Like this is a thing we have radically changed where we can get information from, the speed at which we can get information. And we haven't even really talked about the issue of virality. We got into it a little bit with the Starbucks issue. We right. got into a little bit with CEOs. But we also have the ability for people to, for stories, very small numbers of them, again, power laws. You can never go wrong when you're studying what's happening in the internet and information by, by thinking about power laws first. Most stories don't go viral. Right. The vast, vast majority of dumb stories don't go viral. Small numbers of them do, though, right? And then they can be consequential and they can happen quickly. Right. And they can be politically consequential if they happen in the middle of an election campaign two days before the election. They can be economically consequential if it leads to, you know, for a startup business dropping its stock price by 15 percent at a time that a takeover is taking place. Right. So these things can matter, even though they're, you know, in some degree, they're black swan or power law type events. Yeah, absolutely. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an incredible discussion. Uh, I think we're, we're all still, we're, you know, learning and studying and I think it's uh, constantly evolving and changing and uh, how we consume information. And uh, as we've seen, the, the ratio uh, and speed of which uh, 
business uh, and customers consume data differently and from different channels uh, is just escalating. And so we're consuming more and more volumes of data on a regular basis and trying to synthesize that and, and process it and choose what, what we're interested in processing um, as it relates to what is happening offline as well, uh, how busy people are offline. And I think there's a, a lot of blends there. So certainly for executives, understanding the balance here, understanding how to respond to, to negative customers, negative reviews, online uh, you know, issues, how to handle uh, misinformation. Uh, it is very costly uh, to stock prices. Uh, whenever I was CEO of the hoverboard company, uh, you know, there was a lot of information about the fires. Well, none of them were ours. They were from the 600 knockoff Chinese manufacturers right. were knocking off the product. Um, and, uh, you know, but <laughs> facts don't didn't matter in that case. Right. I could say all day long, ours, they were using the wrong battery. They're using, they're not following the specifications. They're knocking it off. None of ours did. And, and it didn't matter. Right. So I had to change, alter, uh, offer an alternative narrative uh, to, to your point. There's a lot of different strategies as it relates to this. I really appreciate you sharing it from a political perspective. I think there's so much for us to learn because it, as leaders, we have to be able to, to make decisions sometimes, usually without all the information we wish we had. Uh, and right. having to cull a lot of data to determine the efficacy of it. And um, and then we live or die by those consequences, you know, financially as leaders, a lot of times with people and their lives are at stake, uh, you know, most recently with the coronavirus, um, you know, and when the Chinese military took over manufacturing firms and and I'm trying to get supplies for the White House and, and, and other places. And literally, you know, somebody's being skinned alive because they're selling to the United States government to the White House. You're right. And, and, and then their family members are going to go be killed. And so, you know, we don't want to actually put people's lives at risk to 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 you know in situations like that so really being able to th this is not a lightweight conversation to me uh, when it comes to what how do we handle information uh and, and i think it is incumbent upon all of us to recognize that we have a responsibility to be as as dutiful and honest honest uh handling of the uh, of data and information as we can yeah, it's an, it's enormously consequential, and I would just sort of harken back to the things we were saying before that it's just kind of amazing how much this has changed in such a short period of time, um, and it's only going to continue to increase the speed. You know, if you know the speed at which people are able to transmit information, the sort of product innovations in terms of ways that people can consume information, um, and I would push again to really think. You know, people want to think seriously about these kind of generational differences of what it's going to look like for a generation that has come of age with multiple information streams being the norm. Uh, that's going to be a whole other question to being wrestled with and I think is going to be super important for people who are thinking about business and thinking about reputations of companies, but also how you sell things to people like that in those kinds of circumstances. Um, it, is, it is really important to not, ex it, at this moment in history more than any, it's really important to be careful about extrapolating from your own experiences and thinking that's what everybody else is experiencing. Yeah. Um, and I would just put a, a push out, you know, a question out, you know, there are scholars who work in the social sciences, who work in, you know, in the field of political science or so the intersection of social media and politics, also in the communications field, who have really been wrestling with these questions of how the information environment is changing and how it's impacting what's going on in politics that may have lots of useful insights. Some of it may just be methodologies, some of it may be theories about problems, some of it may be empirical work that's been done. You know, we talked through for a while here about these kind of lessons about alternative narratives and the lessons about unlikely benefits, you know, unlikely beneficence. Uh, correcting information, but there's a lot that's out there that you might not, as a as a business executive, normally think. Oh, I should go look at what's being done in the political science research. You know, I want to stick with what's coming out of the business schools. I would say traditional divides in academic research, as this information revolution has rolled through um, the academy as well, the sort of rise of data science has led to all sorts of research being done across disciplinary boundaries that we would pro you know, normally have thought about as being sort of more reified or becoming less so. And so I would, I would advise people to keep an open mind as to where they're going to get the next useful advice that they can, they can take. That's wonderful. Very good. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. It was a pleasure. Take care.